This is episode 11 of the Florida Sound Archive podcast. I'm Jeff Kaiser. My guest for November 2020 is Alex Cooper of Orlando, Florida's Smart Punk Records. In my interview with Alex, he talks about growing up in Orlando, some of the venues and clubs of the early 2000s Orlando scene, his time working at Park Ave CDs, and most notably his time doing Smart Punk Records. From the Smart Punk record label, online distro, and physical Orlando shop, Alex talked about all things Smart Punk. It was fun chatting with Alex about vinyl records, Florida music, and a whole lot more. Thanks, Alex, for coming on and for both being a fan and now a guest of the Florida Sound Archive. If you're on Instagram, consider giving the Florida Sound Archive a follow. There you will find weekly posts from my personal collection of physical media on vinyl, tapes, and CDs, plus sound clips, all music from Florida's past, from rock to hip-hop, jazz to punk, and everything else in between. Want more podcasts? You can always tap into past episodes of the Florida Sound Archive. Lots of interviews covering a wide spectrum of music from all eras. Each month, the Florida Sound Archive brings you a new interview with the people who left their mark on one of the many Florida music scenes. You can also stream all episodes from our website, floridasoundarchive.com. Thanks for listening and enjoy the interview. Um, I'm born and raised here, and uh, I am a 1990, uh, but born in 1990 by just a few days. Um, so I'm kind of a youngin in terms, uh, or, or comparatively to who I learned a lot about music from. Okay. Um, a lot of my uh, the folks I worked with in record stores, especially when I was in like high school and college were um very much senior yev- level or um the old school and i was very much the new school because uh started working in record stores when i was 18 and most everybody else at that shop was like 10 10 15 years into working there so i was very much like hey everybody like what's going on <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> hey i like this this and this and they're like oh i love mars volta and it'd be like yeah all right guy well uh get back to me when you discover king crimson and it was like and that was kind of the path and uh sure but but some of my earliest memories i think um when i was a kid i had gone to the peaches up in altamont here in orlando and i think that may have been the only official peaches but i remember that sticking out and being a memory that i've carried with me um uh, uh i think my babysitters that when i was like elementary and middle school but probably elementary school i assume at that point had a um picked up a copy of jane's addiction ritual and then um nice probably smashing pumpkins melancholy and i remember thinking like okay i've seen cds before but that is this is two cds together this is odd and so like just like weird (laughs) little oddities or like things that kind of I think freak us out when we're kids and right. it's not a big deal now it's a double cd whatever but at the time i was like what is this it's different and so being brought to a peaches record store i was like man this place kind of smells funny these people are weird what is all this stuff anyway and uh and it just it sticks with you um of course but yeah like so much of my music history because i never played music is steering towards venues and and record stores like all of my that that's where everything like uh like that's how my brain catalogs information whether it's a (laughs) a trip that i've taken like oh i went to this record store and they told me like that's the key about record stores is like it's uh the key to the city on a budget like those guys are going to know where the best restaurants in town are and the where the coffee shops you want to go to or oh there's this show tonight like that's always right. been like my memory bank for trips or records that remind me of like, oh, that's when this person and we really like broke up or, oh, this reminds me of like a, a fond memory. Like my parents and I love Tom Petty and saw him a million times, but 
yeah the, the the memory associated with music for me is always going to be in like uh, record stores and uh, and live shows and growing up in the general orlando area at what point did you start to go to local shows and start checking out the music scene that was around you i think that in middle school going into high school some of my friends like older brothers started like we started tagging along with them uh and going to really bad uh metal shows okay. like middle school high school oh we're bad we're not skaters because we're not very good at skating <laughs> so we're metal now like i like just pushed to the fringes of of uh society at that age and uh so I went to the like the Haven and Island Oasis and Ozone CDs. Those three, I think, for a very short period of time in Orlando, were so like monumental to maybe ten people. Oh, wow! <laughs> and I'm okay. that tenth person, but like, oh wow, uh, they're just like the like when when you can mention Ozone CDs to somebody uh, and them go, oh yeah, I remember Ozone the the venue was such and i i don't want to speak ill of it whatsoever but it was constructed in such a way that the floor like it was a cd shop up in altamont so there was right. not a lot of um and it was at a time like probably in the mid to late 2000s where cd's shops like independent cd shops like that weren't really uh uh very popular uh, yeah. So the place starts hosting shows and all ages shows, picking up any middle school, high school band that'll play, whatever. But they ended up getting some like, at the time, bigger artists come through. I think Zayo maybe played there and okay. Horse the Band. Okay. And there was this lure about uh, the Horse the Band show because it had it was one of the only shows that I assume had ever sold out at that venue and. Uh, like the floor shaking because the way that this building was it was on the lake um but you you wouldn't know there was a lake behind this building because it was there, there were no windows <laughs> um then, uh, okay. but it's at a it's at a slant towards the the lake so kids would go under the building towards the water and like get high and drink or whatever under this venue but then um because of that the, the floor had some give so at this sold oh, wow. out show that I was uh, uh, not, I didn't even go to that show, but the lore of that venue was like, oh man, the horse, the band show where the floor was shaking because it was like so many people like moshing and stuff. But I bet, yeah. It, it's genuinely one of those, like when I started jogging my memory, um, prepping for this conversation, I was like, this is going to be such a corny memory but it's so important and it's so pivotal to me because i'm like that started that whole sensation of oh i can't miss that show or that mm, moment so right. that's been a, a a very uh founding and fundamental concept for me those are the best memories to return back to <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah there's there's a there was really a ve a, a venue there, there were two really crummy little uh, venues that um, let some of those screamo, faux, hardcore bands play at at the time. It was the Haven and Island Oasis, and they were separated by about like probably a half mile um, okay. up by like in the UCF area. And the one thing that stuck out for me with Island Oasis was I was I was going to those shows even before I had any idea that like or i was like maybe music is something that i want to do but maybe like maybe i'm just a fan maybe i just appreciate and so right one of the guys who did sound there would always play this really weird like really weird music and i was like just starting to like tap into converge or uh blood brothers things like that and so okay. he was playing a lot of like discord record stuff and black eyes which Black Eyes on the Discord like catalog sticks out like a sore thumb. Sure. I, I love that band, but they are so bizarre and so weird. And my 14 year old brain was not ready for it. <laughs> right. uh, but I was like, I remember the guy uh, uh, who was doing sound at this 
50 cap room playing black eyes and probably drive driving everyone out of the venue but me i'm like tapping on his little door and i'm like hey man who is this and right. uh and getting into that but yeah those were the days before shazam and you could just figure out who it was <laughs> yeah um where where i had to the brightly like uh in a positive light you got to start a conversation in a negative light a 14 year old kid is bothering <laughs> some 30 year old dude he's like yeah it's black eyes now back off dork. Yes. get away from my booth <laughs> so you were going to some shows checking out bands and i also read and keep me honest that you had gotten your start working at at park avenue cd is that right bingo yeah and yeah. um, that's a gentle segue um, in a very similar capacity, a very similar story where I would take my allowance, my like lawn money and go buy CDs from Park Ave while it was still on Park Ave. And I have a very distinct memory and I'm pretty sure it was my buddy Mikey who still works there, used to be in the band uh, Spit Valves. Okay. And now he's yeah. in the band The, the Attack. Um, he... And I recounted this with him recently where he was totally embarrassed by the whole thing. But I said, Hey, I think that the first time I applied uh, to park Ave, I was probably 16. I think I was buying a Dane cook CD or something stupid. Interesting. You know, like <laughs> we, we have our paths. Um, I was, I was buying a CD and uh, I was like, my my parents were like, yeah, you should ask for a job. You really like it here, whatever. And I'm with my parents and I very nervously like walk up to the front counter. I buy my CD and I, and, and I ask Mikey, I say, Hey, um, so I was wondering, I'm still in high school, but I'd really like a job here. Do you guys hire kids in high school still? Um, okay. It's like what my mom had coached me to say at the time. And, uh, <laughs> okay. So Mikey kind of sizes me up and, and like leans back, crosses his arms at me and goes, and it's around the holidays too. So he's like, well, you know what? I don't think we have an age limit on who we hire, but our Christmas parties get pretty wild. So I don't <laughs> think we hire anybody under 21. And I so shamefully walked out of there like tail between my legs. But when I recounted that story with him recently, he was like, what a stupid fucking thing to say. This is so lame of me. That was so, so dorky. Why did I say that? Yeah. Yeah. Not a real thing, but, but right. yeah, a, a couple of years later, still in high school. Um, and once they had moved over to uh, their new and larger location, I applied again and mentioned that like, I think I had an interview cause it was like the, the shop butt up to a, uh, a baseball field on the back, uh, on the, on the back of the property. And so I had an interview with, uh, Sandy and Shelly. Sandy's the owner and Shelly was the manager there for years. She's a, like, she's an Orlando, like stalwart. She has yeah. opened the house of blues. She's done a ton of stuff for Orlando scene. And so, yep. um, I went in for an interview with them. They, and it was the first real, like, I think it might've been like the first real interview I'd ever been in. And so they were like, all right, go through their series of uh, uh, questions and had asked at some point, like, what, like, they asked you like general questions, like what's the last three records you picked up? What's, what's your experience like? And I'm okay. almost certain they knew my experience was none, but then like started asking me, I, I, Oh, like they asked about availability. When could I start? Are you in school? Are you taking classes? Yada, yada, yada. Right. And I was like, well, I start summer semester in college, um, but I am going to Bonnaroo in, uh, uh, in a couple of weeks. And they were like, okay, 17 year old dork. Like you're going to <laughs> like this like gigantic music. And that was really kind of as Bonnaroo was like rising to the level that it is now. Sure. Um, and they were like, who are you going to see? And I was like, I'm going to see this, this, and this. And I, I'm, I might be filling in some blanks, but I don't know. I remember that being like kind of like a weird little proving ground of like who I better name the cool bands I'm going to see. And then 
just knowing that there's no cool answer to that. There's just right. like, like I, I think that if I had a 17 year old kid come into my shop now asking or like coming in for an interview and mentioning that he was driving three States away to go watch music all day, I'd be like, hell yeah, whatever you're into, <laughs> that's sick. You're, <laughs> you're passionate and you're down with this. And that was, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't going to like do, I went with my family. I went to right. to like Bonnaroo and some other music festivals with my parents and my little sister for like 10 years. So, and none of us were, we're, we're not lunatics beyond that. Like we're, I'm not doing acid with right. my dad. We're just like, it's, I mean, I guess it's maybe a little weirder than that. It's my dad and I stood outside for 16 hours a day watching everybody from Radiohead to Manchester Orchestra and Dungan and whatever else. So sure. they were, I, th I remember them laughing that off and being like, all right, well, when you get back from Bonner, like let's, let's get you some hours. So, yeah. And then I worked there from 2008 until 2015. Okay. Still drop in there like every week and bother those guys. Cause I love that shop to death. And, Man. uh, and yeah it's a, it's a great shop it's such a like cornerstone to our music scene like why is there is. such a gigantic and successful record store in orlando florida of all places like right our music scene is strange and bubbling but i think that the the park Ave has done more for um florida music than than i mean has done quite a bit for right florida music for sure it's a survivor there's no doubt they they hustle. The, that, they do. The yeah. guy who owns that spot, Sandy, I remember this from that interview too. He said, this is a high octane environment. This is not a, or oh, you're going to like sit on your phone or watch it, watch Netflix. And probably Netflix was, and it's, in, it's probably still DVD Netflix, but yeah, it was a high octane environment. Right. You're going to, we have, there's always something to work on. There's always something to do. And uh, he maintains that to this day. And that's why they're as successful as they are. And while you were working at Park Avenue, you mentioned some of the CDs you had picked up and that were in the collection. Were you at that point buying records? Were you starting to collect them at that point? When did you start to get into more of the vinyl? It was prior to working at the shop. Okay. I try to recount this honestly. Sure. And it's fairly difficult, like to, to the, the, the inception of the, this obsession. But, um, <laughs> right yeah i think that it's got to be something as like deeply psychological as like a uh, connecting with my dad to some degree because i was like in middle school i could tell like that i was going to be a dork and, a mu and and obsessive about music that i would have to challenge myself to not talk about music with people um truly and uh Okay. <laughs> and so my dad, I think like him giving me his record collection and nothing wild, you know, it was Tom Petty, Bob Dylan, the doors maybe right. it was like the most adventurous, like music he had in his, uh, you know, he had like a couple of Molly Hatchet records too. Okay. That were, like when you get okay. those records as a kid, you're like, Whoa, this cover's real freaky. And my right. dad, Oh, my dad was a metal head. And then you put the record on. It's like, maybe he wasn't a metal head, but at least he liked to party. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, so Molly was, and Molly Hatch is from Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, he gives me his record collection, his old turntable. He's like, I don't know if this thing works, but here you go, idiot. <laughs> and so I, I get, I, I think it starts with something like that. And then I know that cause I, during lockdown earlier this year i had cataloged what i have in my collection and my collection has ebb and flowed like i've trimmed some of the fat over the sure. years especially when we opened up smart punks record shop that was a really good opportunity for me to be like all right i'm making peace with some of these things because i do there are records that are memory like this is i'll pull out a record and be like oh this is from when i was that that record I bought in the UK. I bought that at the uh, Sounds of the Universe Soul Jazz the first time I ever went to and 
the only time I ever went to the UK. Right. Um, but I was making peace with records that were just memories, not something I was listening to, not something that I'm like, Oh, will I ever see a copy of this again? Um, yeah. but letting go of some of those things. But, uh, but it, when I was going through my collection, when I was cataloging everything, I found some stuff from probably 2004 that I was like, okay, this has got to be one of the first, like this Iron and Wine record is probably one of the first records I got. Clap your hands, say yeah. I remember having to like, because they were like a Wichita distribution, but were very much like the new wave of independently distributed music and independent music right. uh, at that time. Arcade Fire, a lot of like that golden age indie rock, or uh, my golden age indie rock. But then uh, Mars Volta, yeah. I think that Mars Volta's intricate, and, and that was like one of the things that introduced me to this is rare, this is sought after, this is a collectible thing. Right. Um, was probably Francis the Mute. You know what? That year, my mom got me for Christmas that record there was like a 250 glow in the dark limited edition variant of that and right. a couple of pressings of cat stevens harold and maud so that was like i think that's probably the inception of me like insisting on being unique and obscure <laughs> and putting my personality into this record collection uh, that's that's probably the beginning of that, I'd imagine. Okay. And working at the record store, I was like, I know I'm never going to make a lot of money doing this, but I'm sure. going to get discounts on records. I'm going to get some free po promos, yeah. some posters, some T-shirts right. and whatever. I'll get into shows for free. Like, that was absolutely the crux of it for me in high school and college. And, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was worth it. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All kinds of fun perks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a... Uh, it, <laughs> It was, it's, I mean, I think that my, so my girlfriend and I moved into our house at the beginning of the year too. And the one thing that I was like, just gen genuinely so stoked about, I was like, this is the last time I'm going to move my record collection. I'm never going to have to like <laughs> move this stuff again. Well, uh, eventually. Yeah. But this is the last time I'm going to like borrow a hand cart from work and, go through an apartment complex, like dragging a ton of records. Yeah. <laughs> it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> so it's yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of work. And uh, I've always the last, I don't know, the last couple of years, thankfully I have a house now. I don't plan on moving anytime soon, but I'd have to hire movers. It was just too much for me to move. And, I pitied them for having to do it because <laughs> I, I, I would, I would look at their faces when they saw all the boxes lined up and they said, what are all these? I said, this is my record collection. Oh, I think we're a type. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would, I think, I, <laughs> I, would I think some of them know. I think some of, <laughs> I think the guys that moved on one of our moves um, a few years ago, I'd moved temporarily into another, like, for a short term before we moved into the house into an apartment yeah and we hired movers at that time and i think they really took their time i said this is the boxes these are records so they're a little heavy and be a little gentle and i think one of them like stood up kind of stretched his back and was like oh okay you're a record guy asshole <laughs> <laughs> right you better yeah. give me a good tip <laughs> yeah yeah i think that's exactly what happened so after you wrap things up at Park Ave, at what point did you make the transition to starting Smart Punk? It was, there was a little gray area because after I graduated college, because mm. um, I, I went to UCF, right. I worked at Park Ave Junior that was on campus for a year or so. And yeah, yeah, we'll dive into that a little bit. Like, I, I have this little shop that that's a one man show. Uh, it's me, and my buddy Seth, and Sean, who um, are both running it, or we're all, all of us running it. And um, over the summers, fifty thousand students clear out. You know, there's two okay. months where it's really quiet, and that was probably in two thousand nine or two thousand ten. They said 
we, we, we had asked SGA who was in charge of, from what I understand, um, the tenants in, in the, that building. And they said, uh, we, we had asked for like a reduced rate in um, rent for those two months, right. something, or at least to have like some sort of a conversation about it. And they came back with some, what of a spicy email that was like, we can't reduce rent because we have to do that for everybody. And plus our students have um, iTunes anyway. And it was like, <laughs> whoa, what, what the hell? Like, yeah. <laughs> we, we just, we, you, 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 we just asked about rent. You didn't have to like shit on our entire industry. That was yeah. Weird. <laughs> uh, and yeah. so we moved the shop out of uh, off UCF. At that point, I had a year and a half, two years left of school, and I was feeling like, okay, I don't want to live and die in a record store. I'm, I have a, I have a, uh, I have a degree. I have to apply that to something. And sure. so I started working at, when I, when I graduated, I started working at a health center in town in their development, um, like with a development position, helping with um, insurance and the um, ACA, Obamacare, people having questions and getting enrolled in that. Okay. And it was, it felt like an altruistic, it felt like a, a good position to be in. I felt like I was helping people. Right. Um, but after a couple of years of doing that and doing the record store part-time, um, I was like, I can get a job like this whenever I want. I can, this is, there's a boundless positions like this. I'm at 25. This isn't what I need to do. If I sit here, I'll be happy. It'll be fine. But okay. my buddy, my buddy, Jordan, I ran into Jordan at a uh, wrecking ball fest up in Atlanta. I forget what really drove me up there. Like what was, what was happening? Cause the lineup was great, but it's something that I, I don't know. Uh, I think my friend Tierney, who also worked at the shop, she's in this band, the pauses had okay. run. She had run the, uh, orange, you glad music festival, um, which was a really, really, uh, local focused, um, music festival for a couple of years. I think she was either playing or had a buddy, um, who was playing and we end up there go to one of the merch tents and I look up at the smart punk sign and then I look behind the counter and it was my buddy Jordan and I'm like what are you doing here he's like I'm working and I'm like for smart punk and he's like yeah and I was like I thought that was that thing from Warp Tour he's like it is and I was like what is it <laughs> and he was like well a lot of people ask that question yeah um because <laughs> i truthfully all those years of going to warp tour i didn't i just saw the name and was like that's a cool thing and i've heard of this music on the brain comp i got that that was cool um but didn't really have a strong understanding of what the organization was what right. they did whatever and he fills me in that it's gone through like a couple of iterations. It's passed hands from people who were involved at uh, Fearless Records to some other folks. It had been in some incarnation a that they were doing CD pre-orders online and promotions and coupling that with a YouTube channel where there was exclusive content and interviews. Right. Put it to bed for a little bit. And then when I ran into Jordan that's when the incarnation was that we were doing a record label, an online shop, and then presenting shows, still keeping that like sponsorship level um, of, of interaction, but putting our name on a stage at uh, Wrecking Ball or Riot Fest or Punk Rock Bowling in trade for pushing the label and pushing the online store. Got it. Um, and I was like, man, that's really cool. And at that point, when he, when he mentioned it, I was like, this really isn't my genre. I grew up in this, but I 
have worked in a record store for long enough to where I have abandoned all of my interest in Blink-182 and Green Day. <laughs> and now I like only Sun Ra and Fela Kuti and, and Blue Note jazz records. I'm too hip for this. Goodbye. Okay. Um, but, but, but I said, no, this is really interesting. And um, uh, I would love to know more about it with my experience in the shop and ordering, I'd love to like, and I think at that point I was just like desperate for something to lend my soul to. Cause my job was not like, was not my soul at that point. So working in the, at Park Ave a couple days a week was really where I felt like, oh, this is creative or involved and putting music in front of people. And that's my passion. So um, oh, if I can work on smart punk, this can be something that's creative and involved and I can like be a part of and learn from because right. if I was going to work for a label or a distribution company, I was looking at being 25, moving to New York or Chicago or LA and, uh, or, or Nashville and starting as an intern. And I was like, right. man, this is, that would be, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can take that leap, um, confidently. Right. So this seemed like a, I was like, yeah, it seems really cool. And he's like, well, it's kind of just me and my buddy Grant at this point. Um, they were, they, both of them work for a merch company and we're just like kind of do This is kind of like our hobby and this is what we do on the side. So eventually we want to expand it and do smart, just smart records, all genres, whatever. Um, but yeah, I'll give you a call. Like when, when we get there, I'm like, yeah, man, if there's anything you need, along the way let me let me know right and then like a month or two later he was like actually i spoke to grant and we have a position for you and distribution if you want to like jump on board and i was like never gonna get a chance to say yes to this again so hell yeah let's do it <laughs> so i quit my job where i had uh <laughs> uh like three weeks paid vacation uh a 401k great yeah. health insurance uh, a desk with my name on it to uh to to uh truly join a band of uh like some of my best friends these guys are and they're amazing and they're 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 really nice and and uh but just like absolutely threw me in the van type of a, a character i very yeah. much became like the roadie of this group of uh of dorks because most of the guys who are involved in in, in this level of uh Smart Punk, I think are all, yeah, we're all, we've all been in bands. Alex Kenny has not. Alex Kenny had run um, a straight edge um, clothing company okay. and a record label back in the day and done some promotions, worked with Live Nation. Like that guy's had, ha had a lot of experience in a lot of different directions with the music right. industry. And so he was kind of like the brain for me to pick my little like guru. Right. Jordan's been in Rory Teenagers um, and I think worked at Hard Rock for a while. I don't know. Matt Burns is in um, Debt Neglector. He, his, his uh, parents had a mu uh, uh, the talent farm down south, okay. which had become like a little notorious warehouse music venue. Um, and so, yeah, they all had, and, and Grant has, Man, what's Grant's bar that was up in Gainesville? 1982? Yeah, I think that sounds right. And he's in the band Suck Brick Kid. So all of them had this like punk rock ethos. We don't, we're going to leave our jobs and our girlfriends and our wives for a couple weeks a year and, and tour and pretend to be 17 again. Yeah. And I'm over here like, I'll buy records for you guys and fulfill some orders. And <laughs> that, that was kind of the, uh, the beginnings of it um what year was it I, that was 2015 okay so this is i think as of last week i'm at my five years with smart punk nice um and at that point i was like okay i'm jumping in with this guy alex kenny and these people who are involved in merchandise and these folks who've done this and my buddy tanner had worked there um before he opened up his coffee shop um easy luck in town and um he uh and so I was like going into it thinking I'm going to absorb all this information that these guys have and, th and, and learn from them. And so I can do this job and be the function, but I'm really going to observe everything that these guys are doing. We were all kind of just figuring it out over the last <laughs> couple of years. We had, we had some 
genuinely like great connections and had been involved in different angles of the music industry, but in terms of contracts for artists, distribution yeah. deals, um, PR rollouts and record cycles, proper touring. I don't think any of us really had any idea what that looked like. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been a, a wild ride. What's one of your funny, what's one of your funniest stories or craziest stories from that period of kind of figuring things out on the, on the go? I really do not want to say like period of time because we're very much like, that is to say that there was an infancy and we are out of that. Yeah. We are so not, we are still very much (laughs) figuring things out. But that being said, I think some of my favorite, like there was some really dumb stuff. Like we, would for some of the music festivals you'd have to figure out like lodging and whatever and for pre-fest and fest one year i think i convinced um my boss to instead of paying for a hotel in ybor for a couple days and a hotel in downtown gainesville for a couple days that we should just rent an rv okay (laughs) um very expensive very dumb yeah. A lot of fun. Um, and just a mixed bag of characters who were sitting outside the main strip of Ybor, d- like drunkenly wandering into our RV at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, Sounds like think, Ybor. <laughs> and then we parked our van in the middle of like, in the middle of Main Street, Gainesville for, for fest that weekend too. So I'm a bit of a baby in the group too. Like mm. I'll have three drinks and be like, Good night. <laughs> um, I'm like Irish goodbye out of there. Um, and that was like, I trapped myself with that. There was, there's no, I don't have a room. I don't have a key. We're all in the same RV and people are, that was a very, very silly weekend. But the notorious, and this is, I guess this is a pretty good gauge of just how notorious things got. Cause we're not that raucousy, but we were out in LA. Okay. And I think we had driven from Vegas to LA. Yeah. For, for one of the events. And somebody immediately when we got off the plane was like, I'm going to get some edibles. I'm going to the dispensary. I'm going to get some edibles and let's go to an angels game. And I remember getting very freaked out at an angels game, like walking around wanting to just see every part, every seat in this building, but then um, really wanting some Dippin' Dots and looking into Matt's eyes and and him going, (laughs) what did you say you wanted earlier? And I was like, Dippin' Dots. And he's like, why? And I was like, I don't know. There's something about going to like a baseball game or a basketball game and getting Dippin' Dots, like an amusement park and getting (laughs) Dippin' Dots. All right. (laughs) And he's staring at me. Uh, Yeah, I don't blame him. (laughs) taps me on the shoulder and says turn around and there's a dip and dot stand and it really took us all yeah and i was just thrilled i was crying i was just like this is what i want this is what i needed and we we got some dip and dots <laughs> i think there was some other moments of like just being really stupid and sneaking down into like the 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 lower part of the uh because we bought bleeder seats and uh snuck down into the nicer seats looked around and realized that it was like most definitely like a like local school night where it's just four grown adult men sitting around a bunch of children. We're like, Oh, we got to get the fuck out of here. And so we went up to our seats and the bleeders. And I remember like getting up there, I'm a little afraid of heights. And so I very gently sat down in my seat and then was like, oh no, it's too high up. I have to leave. And I just sat down, got right back up and like walked away and they lost me for a couple minutes. (laughs) But, but that RV trip, I remember the guys taking a picture of me because you have to return the RV empty of all considerations. And uh, so I was, had never done this and I had to uh, drain the RV of its, um, used water and there is a very much a picture of me that i think is saved on my boss's phone of me sweating (laughs) gloves like pulled up to my shoulders uh 
gagging and like nearly puking uh doing that and i'm and i think like that is uh i think maybe that photo is a good representation of my my time and and how i lend myself to um to smart punk because i guess somebody has to yeah has to do has to do it you know somebody's yeah. got to do it and uh i think i tend to be that guy sometimes yeah <laughs> that is not to say that smart punk is a team effort because we all end our time in different ways sure but yeah the really like yeah the dumb stuff i definitely uh i i get i get to take care of that sometimes <laughs> i came from a corporate uh, uh sort of position where the first couple of years I took minutes. I scheduled meetings. I sent everybody like uh, invites to, to a meeting that was like right around the corner uh, yeah. from our, like, like to, to meet in the boardroom. And then after like two years, I was like, Oh, this is not what we do here. <laughs> I think I remember our second anniversary, like our second annual meeting of me being there. There was some description in our minutes of having roles and goals I know that sounded corny. I know it was stupid, but I was like, this is the way that we can improve things. This is how we can like set, set ourselves some, some uh, uh, scheduling and some goals. And in six months, in a year, in three years, we can go, oh, that's not where we wanted to be. Or, oh, we greatly exceeded this, Yeah, et cetera. I, we, I still have those minutes. And those were the last yeah. minutes we ever took in, in, uh, as, as a team. Yeah. Probably the last real meeting that wasn't... Uh, at somebody's house or at a bar or at a show that we had. Yeah. <laughs> it's sad. I mean, I guess it sounds slightly no like wild, but really when it, when it comes down to it, uh, I think Jordan is our, like when we try to de define like our uh, demographics and our, our, our key audience numbers, who we create social media for, what records we're buying, right? What our brand stands for, and who who is our who are our customers? I really like carving out a place for um, Jordan to be the poster child of Smart Punk because he's an adult man, but still very much loves every band that he listened to when he was eleven to yeah. to seventeen. Yeah. Which for me, starting here. I wanted to throw away. I really wanted to throw, like, I really stood on like the, oh yeah, I used to listen to Green Day. I used to listen to Blink-182. And he's the antithesis of that. So okay. I have learned to round that out for myself and to have like some space in my heart for those bands. Like, I think most certainly through all this, I have, uh, AFI was like the real and, and Converge were probably the two bands I gravitated to most greatly at those, at, at, at that time sure. that Jordan holds so much to, but um, it's made some space in my heart for those bands. But, but Jordan is a, a key demographic. We certainly like don't want to just buy records and create a record label for aging punks, but there's space for it. Like that, that, type of person who is settling into their careers probably isn't going to shows during the week anymore uh whatever um i i really like creating um and building out a space in the record label the record store and the online shop for people like that who are like yeah. you know what i've always wanted to have the black flag discography i'm gonna buy all the disc black flag records bad religion i remember my older brother gave me those records i want all nice. these out. like the the like early 2000s bad religion that i think in a pretentious way i was like oh yeah i listened to that when i was a kid and i only listened to the like the early stuff now uh <laughs> now i'm like no i love those records because that reminds me of that time and place right and i think that that's i've learned that very much from jordan on the other hand, there's like the other the other demo and, and and I think like audience we work with is like developing bands and labels on like labels that we work with, not just with their like evergreen titles. Um, Hopeless is one of our like I I love that label. I love everybody who works over there, and I really like their um, relationship that they have with their bands, and they have 
been around long enough to where they've got some like tried and true punk bands that they that are they're part of their um back catalog that are evergreen titles but they also work with a lot of really new artists who are developing and are trying different sounds out in the genre right that i didn't know two years ago uh they they had started signing some artists who were doing a lot of like crossover into like like a lot having a lot of like hip-hop influence and i was like yeah this is not for me but here we are two years later and machine gun kelly is making a like reverse crossover punk record and there is a demographic for like that middle ground and that like fusion uh uh and that, that that's a big thing for a lot of young kids so yeah you mentioned some of these relationships with these other labels and stuff and so there's there's clearly different parts of of smart punk right you've got the store you've got the label in the store is that where you spend most of your time this year yes okay um the way the story goes with the the record store the physical uh brick and mortar shop yeah is um the online store was mainly run by my buddy tanner and i we brought on matt to do events mainly because he just wanted to go to riot fest to see the misfits (laughs) um and now matt is very much in charge of and is like moving the label forward and in a in a big way but when it was just the online shop and the label and the events there were days where i was like there hasn't been a record store over by ucf in almost like six or seven years now ucf has six five thousand students living on that side of town uh they were doing some like pop-up shops and uh flea markets um throughout the spring and fall semester and i was like we can set up the same way we do at riot or fest or wherever and bring out some records. I don't know if college kids are going to like care about our catalog, but let's do some promo. Let's, let's put it out there. Yeah. So we started with a lot of label promotion and, you know, slip mats and stickers and, and shades to give away and then bringing out catalog pieces that were probably some what like crucial classics um stooges talking heads bad religion but then also bringing in a lot of like fallout boy panic at the disco green day paramore stuff like that right um and eventually and and i I shouldn't say eventually i should say like immediately kids would be like do you have mac miller do you have tame impala do you have miles davis records like there there's a really great jazz community at UCF that I've been like, it's very much where I gravitate to, but, um, but yeah, like kids started asking about different genres and I was like, I can get that. I can get that. Yeah. Come back next week and I'll have a team Impala record. And so we started doing that. And I think once those started picking up and becoming like, we would do them like once a month and then we'd do them every other week. And then we started doing them the whole season that's when we started entertaining the idea of a record store. Okay. And I pushed up against it quite a bit uh, mm. to begin with. Cause I was like, I already did record store. I want to do record label. I want to do, I, I was, I, I, I felt like I had graduated and yeah. was very much brought back in to, and realized that this is, this is one stream of things. This is something you can utilize all of your, like, cause I, I'm not, a, like, I, like I said, I'm not in a band. I'm only dedicated fan. So I can take all that fandom and technical research and knowledge and apply that to buying out a shop and uh, yeah. creating a well-rounded uh, record store. And there wasn't a record store within seven, within 10 miles for seven years. So they were like, yeah, just start a record store. Yeah. And so we did. And um, that started two years ago. I think we got the lease in July and did a pretty standard build out, had like some soft opening. And, and when I say soft opening, like we kept the sign from the previous business out, like lit up <laughs> for months. <laughs> It still said Natura coffee and tea for like a a while. Right. <laughs> um, 
so people were like coming inside going you guys still sell coffee and tea and like nope just records yeah. <laughs> like okay weird we did that for a couple months and i think we were officially open in october just before fest and that was very much i, th I think it really was me and one other employee at the time page um running it and then beginning of the new year brought a couple more people on and last year was wild we did record store day it was yeah. incredible and with all the hesitation i had with like starting a shop like this is going to cost a lot of money this is going to take a lot of time like this isn't you don't start a record store and immediately just start making money no, no matter yeah. exactly not, not yeah. that i really need to explain that to anyone but yeah yeah it's it's a long haul sure um but all my hesitation really washed away when like things were like 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 people would start coming in, kids would start coming and be like, oh, I've never been into a record store before. This is awesome. Like, oh, this is really cool. I just got my first turntable. Older folks who were like, I haven't been into a record store in years. And um, people buying their first turntables, like really bringing that uh, warm hearted sensation of like, oh yeah, this is what I love about this stuff is, uh, is, is putting music in people's hands and, uh, it's a it's a good feeling. I I, re, I really sure. enjoy it. And last year we had a strong staff and some really um, great people uh, working at the shop. And then this year, with everything going on, I because last year I was splitting my time quite a bit. I was doing some time in the office, some time in the shop. Right. Um, this year, yeah, with everything going on with COVID, I've had some employees move away. Yeah. Um, I've had some employees find other jobs full time where I'm like, absolutely do your thing. Like I I've managed to stick to hiring people who, and then I guess this is just like fact of the matter when you work in a record store where it's a place where it's passion driven, people are not working at a record store to make a ton of money. So you got to enjoy what you're doing and you've got to enjoy the people you're working with. So I'm really grateful for everybody who's come through the door, but when they find something else, like that's, a full time or on a schedule out of town. I'm like, yeah. yeah, do your thing. Thank you so much for being here. And now, yeah, see you later. Do your thing. A little bit of that happened. And then COVID, we had locked down for a month. And then I think we had like given some breath and some time to technically like be fully back open. And I was doing some curbside stuff and so forth. And during the George Floyd murder, I was like prepared to open that week. And then I was like, this isn't the right. Yes. That wasn't, this isn't a good time to do that. We got to focus on some more, like some different things, but yeah, yeah all things considered um, short version of that question. Answer, uh, the answer to that question is yeah. The majority of my time is spent at, at the, uh, the record store. Okay. I, I'll jump in real quick too and say, I hope I've given you plenty of material to just <laughs> trim back, just just carve away at. Um. <laughs> That's part of what I do too. Yeah. So so you being more you being more in the shop, thinking about some of the records that have come through the doors. It, from your memory, what's been one of the most collectible, most rare, most expensive records that you know has sold uh, in store? Matt brought me the most expensive record we have. It has not sold. Mm. I put it on the wall for a couple of days and then I just didn't feel good about people touching it. <laughs> um, and I mean, any good record store has like their little secret stash of stuff. Um, sure. But, of but um, he brought me a uh, first edition of that first uh, Fall Out Boy record. It's got the six like little baseball card style records. And I think, I don't think I even put a price tag on it, but that record's mm. gone from anywhere from like, a, uh, like I think it's gone for upwards of like $2,000. Wow. Um, and I feel like an, I would feel like an asshole putting that price on that record. You know, <laughs> like there, there are certain yeah. things that I can like justify sure. um, putting a price tag on, but that one I was like, I, I don't know what to do with this. Um, <laughs> so it's there. And if anybody who listens to this uh, inqu inquire within, but um but yeah, like we, we've had some, um, it's really interesting because Orlando does have such an, uh, a, a great like system 
uh, of record stores in place. We have a lot of record stores at this point. And yeah. I do very much consider Park Ave to be the crown jewel. They are just like a, they've been at it for years and they've been doing such right. like covering all their bases, creating great programming with the in stores, um, promotional things and so forth. But then rock and roll heaven's been around forever and they've, they've got their own set of like wild stories and random nooks and crannies of that record store where you'll go, Hey, I found a box down here guy. And I found this record. And he's like, Oh, weird. That's not for sale. <laughs> or, or like, you, you know, like it's kind of that. I, I like that store, but occasionally you run into that, like, uh, yeah. the, 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 like type of thing. But then there's like a donut shop is the, mm. the boutique. Um, yes, it is. Yeah. That, that record store, um, is very, I, I love very much because Brooklyn, one of the guys who runs it, uh, Brooke and John Santino, um, are two of the uh, loveliest people on earth. And um, Brooklyn, I started buying records from when he, I don't even know where we met. Mm. That's a weird thought. Yeah, I don't even know where Brooke and I met, but um, I started buying records from him out of his garage out in like, uh, uh, out on the coast, like near Coco. Okay. And he said, come over to the crib. I got records. And I drive up to this stranger's house one day and he's got a garage full of records. And I'm like, it's the beach. Why do you got your records in your garage? Mm -hmm. uh, but everything was clean and good and, uh, uh, and, and not warped and destroyed. Yeah. And so I started buying records from him at some point park Ave needed a, a record buyer. And I was like, yo, I know you live on the coast, but we need a record buyer over here. And he's like, I've never worked in a record store. Mm. And I was like, are you serious? Do you have a house full of records? Why, why have you never done this? It's like, I don't know. Um, but yeah, sure. I'll take the job. So he was the record buyer at Park Ave for quite a bit. And then through that, he was like, I'm going to, I, I want to do my own thing. I want to do it different. Cause he, yeah. I mean, his taste is eclectic. Sure. He will, he's the type of guy who, if you try to school him and be like, Oh, have you ever seen this? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Have you ever seen this? Sun Ra record hand painted cover, uh, uh, whatever of liquidity, yeah. and he'll go, Oh, yeah, this one, and just like <laughs> grab it from behind his back, the record shelf just behind him. Yeah, um, he's got that shop. Remix Records is another like descendant of um, one of the record stores and uh, venues in town. They, they mm. started a shop a few years ago, and uh, Orlando Record Stores, we have like our own little pockets, everybody's got their yep. own thing. Um, our shop, I liked being, I, I really wanted to make a point to round out um, essentials. Like that this is what any good record, uh, like, I don't want to say generic, but this is what any record store, re record collection deserves to have is like yeah. Fleetwood Mac and Jimi Hendrix, Beatles, like the, the stalwarts. But like then, then like building out, okay, if you lean into 80s and 90s indie rock if you want everything from 4ad and early merge records let's make sure we have all that stuff let's make sure um the jazz like there's the jazz professors over at um ucf marty morrell who was a drummer for um bill evans okay um in the mid 60s and 70s um cool. he yeah like there's so many random people like that in, yeah. in central florida but Marty, actually, there's actually a lot of those people everywhere. You just got, got to meet them. <laughs> a, they really are. <laughs> like, it, it's really amazing. Like the people I've interact with over the years, just ha that one conversation you have and you learn, oh my God, you actually like know, like, it's just, it's amazing what you can learn from people. Yeah. Anyway. We know we've had like, you're, you're right. Cause of the handful of people who've gravitated to Orlando, there's been like uh, Marty and uh, Larry Coriel lived here. The, the guitarist lived here for a while. Doug Karn yeah. still lives between here and St. Augustine. You know, we've had a, Sam Rivers, um, yeah. the end of his uh, uh, life and career was spent here. He used to show up at like the fat and jazzy uh, with DJ BMF, like doing like really like funky breaks nights at yeah. um, Firestone club mm. downtown, but then would just like show up with a horn and start playing over this like, it was just bizarre like yeah. that guy's a legendary blue note 
musician and would just start showing up at like hip hop gigs playing playing it was crazy but yeah, um, that's crazy with our shop evergreen titles kind of like i really wanted to make sure we nailed the like record store one like one stop 101 for anybody getting into records i didn't want to be too i didn't put when we finally got our sign outside i didn't want it to say smart punk it's got our logo in it but I just says record shop because I didn't want to steer away anybody to thinking we were just like a punk rock record shop. Yeah. Cause I've gone into those shops and I love those shops, but sure. You're not going to buy Bill Evans records from there. You're not going to buy Taylor Swift records from there. You're not going to buy Disney soundtracks or horror soundtracks. You might buy yeah. some horror soundtracks, but like I wanted to make sure that soundtracks were a big part of that too. Cause like, yeah, it is Orlando. People are going to want Disney records. People right. are going to want, um, like the, we got a really great comic shop down the street too. So while that's not like a big thing for me, like I already have my like addictive collectible <laughs> thing. And I yeah. know guys who do cut like figures and, and comics and records. And I just, I can't, I can't go yeah. in all directions, Yeah. but um, I wanted to foster a place for those collectors who can be like, Oh yeah, I want to get Marvel soundtracks too. So we've got a lot of that. Was there ever any thought behind doing more for Florida bands, especially those that, thinking especially back in the 90s where you had a lot of CD-only stuff, was there ever any talk about putting out some stuff from some Florida bands besides Less Than Jake? Absolutely. We had essentially, we'd done um, Losing Streak and Hello Rockview a few years ago. Right. Where we did an exclusive with the guys because they were already, um, they were already, uh pressing the records on their own but we got an exclusive variant um yep. of those records then signing new bands we didn't want we've got a couple of like buddy bands on the label that we're we love we're proud of yeah. but we didn't want to get stuck in the trap of like um just signing florida bands or just being a florida yeah. label sure um so there was that kind of hesitation, but now a buddy of mine who runs a, a vintage shop, one look vintage out in, um, in Huntington beach in, in Southern California, he, um, he came, like we started talking about a MySpace era comp that there were a hundred bands out there mm. that could have been panic at the disco. That could have been fall out boy. That could have been from first to last. And so much of me is hesitant on doing something like that. It's not cool to me. But yeah. then I think about it, I'm like, this is so rooted in nostalgia. And there's, I'm going to find tracks where I'm like, oh my God, I forgot about this record. This was my MySpace song. Like, there's going to be things that if and when we, like, when we start digging up that project, like, we'll find some things like that. that I'm like, man, this is so cool. And how did this, this band had eight songs on MySpace. How did yep. they not get a record deal? How did, how, what, what happened to them? My other thought and, and where I think the Venn diagram of my interests and smart punk brand and everybody else on the team's involvement and, and interests lie is like the, that, that center is uh, bands like quit who you had interviewed um, R Russell. Yeah. Russ, of, yeah, of, Russ, yeah. Yeah. Russ a few months back. Yeah. When I was introduced to that record through Alex Kenny, I was, um i was like how did where did this go where are the bands like this he's like oh man there are like i love this band but you got to come over and look at their like my cds my cd collection my tape collection my my yeah. records because there are so because he's been a part of the south florida music scene for a long time and that yeah. there are a lot of bands that didn't get the shine that they deserved and right punk labels i, I don't know that there's a ton of people digging into that right now i know that there's a collectability to it i know that there are people who are looking for records like that but yeah i don't know that there are record labels who are actively um putting stuff out like that soul jazz did the punk 45 comps and they're putting out record like people are reissuing records like that but not yeah. your regionally successful mid 90s to early 2000s bands which right. i am curious about and i am like yeah huh, I wonder who's out there. Because cause Quit is a band that if nobody, I, I hate to use that phrase, tells their story, but if nobody says this is a band worth listening to and yeah. looking for, you, they might be swept away. They, we, yeah. there, there might only be the 200 people who have that record or 
the couple of thousand people who saw their shows and that'd yeah. be it. So I want to find out more bands like that who yeah. haven't got the shine that they deserved. Right. And that's kind of what I was thinking with it because you look at, let's say the nineties death metal scene in like Tampa, mm -hmm. that area, there's a lot of European labels who have reissued a lot of those bands and a lot of them that pop up from Florida. And, but you think about the punk scene, I, I just, I haven't seen as much interest or as much investment in some of those records and getting them out there, whether they were CD only, whether they were on vinyl, but they were so limited and putting them back out there. I just haven't seen a lot of it from the punk and hardcore scene, definitely more from death metal uh, when it comes to European stuff. And I just found that interesting. And I was just curious to get your thoughts on that too. I like that question. I like that. I think it, I, I want to immediately attribute it to a, an epicenter because at a time Jacksonville, Tampa, and for some reason, Orlando got pretty skipped over on that I-4 transit. But yeah. those two cities were, were the epicenter. Um, maybe at that time, Orlando was really into, like, we, we had an electronic scene at that time where, like, there, there were a couple of clubs in Orlando that were bringing in a lot of really big DJs from, from Europe and, and West Coast. And so maybe that was where our focus was, and maybe okay. that's why it didn't cultivate those bands. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, Tampa and Jacksonville were epicenters, I think, at that time. So maybe that's just it. So the rest of Florida's, there was no punk epicenter necessarily. But then I think, well, Fest in Gainesville was absolutely an epicenter. Uh, my first introduction to to that was a comp that before I even went to the fest, I think I went to a, a record store that was in an old gas station up in St. Augustine that had a freebie bin with a fest seven comp in it. And I recognized a, uh, a small bound bike track on it. And I was like, I think okay. they did a split seven inch with somebody else that I really liked at the time. So I'm going to check this out and found out about fest and realized that no idea was based out of here, hot water music and against me, yeah, yeah. That that this is that Gainesville was an epicenter for punk at a time. I don't think they had any comps at the time, but uh, I only went to the first two uh, back when it was Gainesville Fest. It was yeah. uh, ninety nine and two thousand were the first ones that I think. I, I think those were the first. If there was one in ninety eight, ninety seven, I don't remember. Did you go to the YMCA one? Yeah, the one the one at the YMCA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I promise that's Alex Kenny. Al Alex Kenny helped organize and promote that. Who is now, who is now Smart Punk uh, okay. <laughs> and Co. Kenny, dude, Kenny's got like such a weird, weird history. He yeah. has he has seen literally every band, worked with every time I die in their infancy. Like the dude's just seen some and been in the room for some really weird, like once in a lifetime chance sort of stuff. Yeah, but yeah. I really do try to listen when he talks because he has some cool <laughs> things to say. Yeah. Sure, it's a good story. Too. So, so, so thinking about uh, just kind of where things are going now, you know, with the way it's been with COVID and obviously Smart Punk has had a pretty, has had their foot on the gas when it comes to the online side of things. You know, when it comes to the brick and mortar store, what do you think the future is looking like right now for for smart punk this is this year's certainly been a challenge um right, on one hand i'm just blessed to be doing this as a job like i'm yeah. so so grateful for it and there's been like i've had to remind myself of that over, like over the year um i yeah. get to work with my friends i get to sell records for money and yeah. i can pay my bills off of that i yeah. love that to begin right. with but not not only that i uh, it's i've loved watching this grow this year we've had setbacks some of our like developmental bands aren't touring touring is like what is getting their name out there is with getting yeah. their music out there and it's been um that that's certainly been a challenge but we, we can't starve artists of wanting to put their art out so we want to make sure that music is still coming out even though they're not able to tour off of it so getting creative with things like that and alternatives to like how to distribute what you're putting out well like our our friends keep flying I think we started off with the live record which was like 
kind of a fun thing. It was like, all right, we're not playing shows for a while, but here's a live record. And that did really well. And it's, yeah. it's been, kids have loved like picking that up, but then they've also like that band has just done some like wacky little like merch stuff and uh, it, videos and just like really engaging with their audience. And um, sure. I, I can't say enough good things about those dudes, but then um, somebody like less than Jake, I'm pretty sure they've like played shows together was our tent pole for the year. The, mm. the Anthem and B sides was like what we were, most looking forward to this year yeah. and still is because um we don't have those records yet as of this week and we announced that in march um that has been like a good i, I guess that's in and of itself is like a good example of like what's going on in 2020 <laughs> because we ordered those in march pre-lockdown yeah we seen a couple of things and and i'm absolutely like i'm uh, we'll take responsibility <laughs> but but the pressing plant has gone in and out of function mm. we've had different sales reps because people have had their jobs left their jobs got new sales reps had some stall outs with uh getting test pressings uh shipped out to us and approved by us the band etc and so all things considered, it's taken way fucking longer than it was supposed to. <laughs> right. Um, I've had to try, I've, I've, I've tried to have a little bit of fun with um, some of our communication with that. Um, yeah. Because it's been a little bit overwhelming. We've, ha we've had a uh, customer service reps that we had employed in the past and uh, third party, like uh, customer service reps that had helped us out in the past. Now, guess what? It's just fucking me. It's like <laughs> just me and Matt yeah. emailing people. And trying to have some fun with it, trying to put out some newsletters saying like keeping people up to date. And a couple of weeks ago, I think I pissed off a couple of folks um, who did not like the way I spoke in an email. Cause I was like, please don't uh, get upset at us. Send us angry emails because <laughs> if you do, I'm just going to cry and burn the warehouse down. And they did not like that at all. So to what was, uh, what was, what was, <laughs> what, what was one of the responses you got that stands out to you? Somebody did say, in all, I've never been ashamed to be a less than Jake fan until this, <laughs> until I got this newsletter. And I was like, yo, you're a less than Jake fan who's that upset. That's it. That's crazy. This band <laughs> is just about having fun and being yeah. happy. Yeah. And I want you to be happy. And I know <laughs> not having this record doesn't make, make you happy, but it shouldn't make you angry. Like... <laughs> I don't, I, I've tried to have fun with it and yeah. I really hope that like some of our, and we've kept people up to date. Sure. These records from what I understand are in Orlando, the wrong address that it was dr supposed to be dropped to. That's 14 pallets of records. And we found out today that it was an incorrect address. Yeah. So it's just like the final step of like a very long thing where I'm like, of course you have the address wrong in this, in this thing. But as of tomorrow morning, we are supposed to have these records in our <laughs> okay. possession. Okay. And I'm going to open the boxes and I'm going to put them back in tinier boxes and I'm going to ship them out. <laughs> like, you know, that's it. There had to have been some that have gone out though, right? Yes. I know yeah. that. I know that because I have mine. You have what I think maybe there was one variant we got. And at the time, like a couple weeks ago, we got hit up from the plant and they said, we're shipping you this color variant because it's yeah. ready. And we're going to ship these as they're ready per color variant. I'm like, why are you taking the stamper off the press? Like, just press them all. Come on, <laughs> right. we're, we're taking right. this on and off. <laughs> right. So we did that. We also got the UK variant, which mm. <laughs> went to another fulfillment center in the UK. Oh, no. And we never... We never even saw those but those went out and so the the variant i believe that you have and that um and the uk variants went to people who wanted the record but the people who like at 12.00.1 seconds bought and checked out the record still do not have this <laughs> like the most <laughs> diehard fans still do not have this and it's really 
<laughs> I have to laugh at it because I ha- I will cry if I if I think about it anymore. But like, <laughs> and I don't want to like I'm I'm I am above using the excuse of it being COVID and there's delays and this and that. And it just comes down to like I think we were a perfect storm. I think mm-hmm. this release was not Lady Gaga. It was not this or that. And we ordered it at a time at which it's not a 500 press where you can knock it down, knock it out in an afternoon. Yeah. This was a big order sure. from a big band. Yep. Um, but it just, it was so mishandled and mis- like the, the communication was just off that um, it was tough. It, it, it's been, it's been a tough rollout and yeah. I want, I, I can't wait to get these records in the hands of fans. I can't, I, I want to keep working with less than Jake. They've been amazing to work with and they've been very, very patient with us and sure. the pressing plants, et cetera. And I can't wait to like knock it out and like keep things going. We've got a book with Chris that's coming out that the seven inch and book <laughs> we were making jokes about and uh, that, that, that it might come out before the records get to people. <laughs> But I think we're gonna miss. The, oh. I think we're gonna get these records to people uh, just in time for them to enjoy, and then get the book out. Yeah. Um, I mean the, the, and that band hustles too. Like, they sure. are are constantly working on things. Chris has got a podcast. Like, we're, they're doing the rehasher records that we're working on them with. They, they're just like constantly like hustling on stuff. So yeah. that was something that was really frustrating, and that we understood was like. You guys got a million different products. You got a record coming out on Pure Noise that's sold out 12 different variants already. They've got mm. a Zippo lighter variant that just <laughs> sold out today. You know, like, yeah, there's, they, they just are so, I love it. They're creative. Yep. Merch game's on point. Mm-hmm. And the fact that this has taken as long as it has to get out has been really difficult, but I'm trying to stay positive about it. I'm trying to like fulfill all the orders as quickly as possible, get this to people so we can keep moving and keep like, keep working on cool stuff. So yeah, it's truly a perfect example of like 2020 where you're like, I just got to be, I just got to keep cool and everything's <laughs> going to be all right. Like I got this. <laughs> I'm sure once they have it in hand, it'll be well worth the wait. Cause uh, I hope so. Yeah. It's a good record. It came out. I mean, at least the, I've got the, the, the it's like the B, the B color, the black and the, and the red. And then black oh, and yeah. red, the black and the yellow, I should say. Yeah, it's uh, it's a really nice pressing. This cool, great fidelity. You know, sounds great. That so. makes me that 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 brings me um, uh, immeasurable joy. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait until my customer service platform has changed from, "Hey, I emailed you three times and you haven't responded." <laughs> And I respond with that, like, yeah, I know, I'm really sorry, to, hey, I got my record, and it sounds great. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with it, and I'm having a great day. And I go, right. you're having a great day? Me too, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> but until then. Yeah. It's crazy that Smart Punk is based out of Orlando. It really yeah. did feel like I dropped into my lap, or I dropped into its lap. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, when, when I took it, and um, it's been, this this year has been wild but it's made me reflect on how like what a wild ride it's been right up into this moment and 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 to this moment but um the fact that something like this exists in florida and mm. we're able to like work with some friends we're work, we're able to work with like some heroes of ours right and uh and they're now our friends they call us yeah it's it is insane that it happens in a city like this. That's, that's my reflection on it all at this point. And um, there was a video of somebody reading their, like some little video that's going around on TikTok of a girl reading her um, things to do in 2020. And she's like, travel more, ha! be more social. Yeah, right. <laughs> like spend time with my family. My grandmother died this year. And she like just starts laughing into crying. Yeah. Right. And I remember we had a meeting this year at the beginning of the year uh, at a little tiki bar that um, we were talking about the things we wanted to work on and shape up this year. And I think back, cause I do think I took minutes and notes on that where I was like, I look back at that note and I'm like, what a fucking joke. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to realize like, I'm, this is a weird year, but we've done so many cool things. And yeah. Uh, 
our catchphrase on a lot of our merch and stuff is just smart punk records established whenever. Right. Because I remember smart punk in 2003 seeing AFI at Warp Tour, having right. no idea what it is. I still really don't know what it is. <laughs> And I like that. I think people, like, I think as long as we're in on the joke, people will know that we're in on the joke and they're in on the joke. And then everybody realizes we're just a joke and we're a bunch of <laughs> jokesters, like, who are getting away with murder, putting out records that we like and working yeah. with people that we like. And that's about it. And yeah, that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> Cause in all honesty, I used to